So then I told her, and she said, you have to have What do you need? need Can I swap out? Yep, yep. Or is that going to mess stuff up? No. Nope. I'm uh, just checking. What do you need? Uh, you need. Uh, uh, yep, you want this one here. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. I 
But uh, what? So um, your measurements are the white cells, and then the green cells are the calculations. And for the most part, everybody's calculations look pretty good. Um, one thing that was puzzling to people, though, was that in some cases, the mass that didn't burn was a negative number. How can you have a negative mass? You can't. So what would explain that? How could you end up burning more than what you put in? Right, so if the wick burned, then you could lose mass that way, right? Um, what's another way? So maybe, um, so that's kind of related to the wick burning, you know, there's the mass loss there. Um, well, that's true. There, maybe there was some leftover detergent that affected the so, so the uh, thing that I was referring to was measurement error. I'm not actually referring to chemical errors at all. So how could you, uh, how do you deal with measurement error? And how do scientists deal with that? What are they supposed to do? Repeat the experiment, right? And if you repeat it enough times, then you start to trust that, okay, we did everything right. We didn't make a mistake. So, but one thing that I noticed here is that both of the ethanol groups, let me just see, is that true? No. Now I'm confused. So one ethanol group had a negative uh, result to their, their mass. One group had ended up with a large positive. So I'm not sure what happened on that group. Um, oh, I know what that was. The mass that didn't burn. What was that? That group? So that's a possibility. That's not really a measurement error. That's just a procedural difference, right? Um, My temperature wasn't right. Now, one thing that you guys probably didn't calculate was the number of calories. But how did we come up with that calorie calculation? What is the formula for calories? Mass times specific heat times delta T. So it's the mass times the, the change in temperature. So in our case, we have a temperature change that you guys measured, and we have the mass of the water, which is the volume. So it says milliliters, but what is one milliliter equal to? One gram. And it's also equal to one cubic centimeter, right? So it's equal to one gram, so it's a mass times a delta T, and that gives you the calories. And so that's how we get we got 3840 for the first line. You guys didn't calculate on yours, but my spreadsheet did for you. And so you can see how the number of calories that you got, the more burning you did, the more calories you got, right? So if you had a lot of leftover mass, then you didn't have as many calories, right? You didn't burn. Now what about BTU? What Do you remember the BTU formula from the Saturday workshop? What was that? BTU is the old British way of doing it. It's like a calorie that we use British units. So it would be one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. So that's how you get the British BTU. So to convert between calories and BTU, you can do the math and you'll find out that there's a 252 factor. So if you, if you go through the math, so one BTU is 252 calories, okay? And so that's the formula that's being used in this uh, column O. So the BTU column, that's what we're using. Is we're just taking the number of calories and dividing that by 252, that gives you the BTU. Does that make sense? That's a pretty simple experiment, or a pretty simple equation. 
If you go to the equations sheet, you can find all these just by clicking on the spreadsheet that says equations. <coughs> okay, the last two columns are pretty important. Calories per gram burned and BTU per gram burned. Now, why would we divide through by the number of grams burned? Why is that useful? It makes it easier to compare with each other, right? Because if you do that, then it really doesn't matter if you had leftover in the bottom, right? Because all you care about was how much burned. So you're normalizing by the amount that burned. So based on that information, which fuel had the most calories per gram burned? Which one is it? Six. Is it 36 something? 36. Looks like engine oil to me. We're looking at only your trials, not the leaders. Calories per gram is 36.57. So engine oil and peanut oil both had the highest calories per gram burned. So they generated the most heat per gram. Yeah. Yeah, we're not looking at the trials. Oh, just the trials. Okay, got it. Yeah, the leaders, we didn't do all of the, you guys did them all, we only did some of them. So. Okay. Um, and we had slightly different experimental setup when we did it, so we may have some slight differences. You guys had the same setup for all of yours, right? Um, and then what about BTU per gram burned? That, that actually, problem with that one is that uh, it's only showing to the nearest ones place for the decimal, so you're, like you have zero for one of them, it's not really zero, it's just less than one, right? So it's just another way to look at the same, uh, not same thing, calories per gram burned or BTU per gram burned, same kind of idea. The winners are engine oil and peanut oil. Does that make sense? Comments? I was wondering how, was that artificial um, engine oil or was that heavy engine oil or some range? Did it matter? Engine oil? We only oil? tested one engine oil, so I'm not sure what the other engine oils would do. That happened to be engine oil for, for a snowblower, actually. Oh. But that would be an interesting experiment. Try the different 5W30, Why doesn't make such a big thing out of artificial oil in the winter? Mm -hmm. Synthetic. Yeah. Synthetic, I should call it. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's other... So, you know, the lubrication and the lubrication of the different use than burning. Oh, okay. It's not that it's it's in the air. Is that right? Is that right here? Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Other comments on this experiment? Did, do you see I'm any? That did not have a value. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting, huh? It's a food product. But if we're using it, you know, we're not, we're not, we're in our cars, yeah. Sure. <laughs> right. Using it in the cars, it's not, yeah, you would expect it to do a little better than that. Yeah. Right. So, Again, this is only one trial, right? So we probably want to repeat this just to make sure that the numbers are coming out. And so um, the other thing you can do with this is you can use uh, biomass. So I think you guys talked about this yesterday, biomass. Mm -hmm. And so like this one is wheat straw. You can also use corn. What's the other one? Um, we talked about it yesterday, we talked about corn stove, but we also talked about sugar beet pulp, all kinds of different sugar things. Sugar beet pulp, yeah. That could be made into biofuel. So this, you could do the same thing. Although I'll warn you that we had a harder time getting this to light, to get it to catch on fire. And so then you're having to consider, okay, how much heat am I adding by holding this flame there for a long time, right? So there's an, there's an error. You're introducing error, right? Are there any other errors that you guys noticed maybe that we're introducing in this experiment? I would, I would also add that 
you're, you would be burning the, the roughage, the raw. We talked about yesterday how you would ideally ferment that and make mm. a more flammable substance. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that, but that still does have a value as fuel or biomass. Sure. Other so errors the, in the, yes. The negative mass. Mm -hmm. So that would be the actual wick burning? Yes, it would have to be. So then that would be contributing to the amount of heat generated. Yes. Possibly, yeah. I would think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then that would maybe secure some of our results. Right. So that's interesting, right? So maybe what if some of the fuels caused more of the wick to burn, causing the temperature to go higher? Now, does that skew your results? Right. So maybe we should have weighed all the wicks to make sure they were exactly the same masses. But even doing that, you're not you still could get more burning, right? We did measure that. If it starts burning the wick, you're not testing the test product. So you're not testing, you know, the ethanol, for mm -hmm. example, in this mm -hmm. one. You're also, the contributing would be the burning of the wick, which right. is contributing to the heat. That's right. How would, how would you get around that? Like, what, what method would you do to get around that? I don't use a wick. I don't use a wick when I do this. We need a wick. Hmm. <clears throat> or you could just have more fuel. You yeah. have more fuel. Like that. And that's the wick won't matter. I just think some of the other things, uh, we're also heating up. The, uh, the wire mesh, mm -hmm. you're heating up the glass flask. Exactly. Mm -hmm. When I do my calorimetry, you know, I'm not doing food or anything like this, but we do it inside of a styrofoam cup with a styrofoam, another styrofoam cup is lit just to reduce those environmental factors. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, we're losing a lot of heat up inside. Right. But that, that is another good example of a way to do calibrity with the easy you know that, that bronze level yeah setup. i'm definitely bronze in here. yeah <laughs> but but let me ask you this didn't we make sure that it was equal for all of your experiments didn't we have the same exact equipment so shouldn't the heat loss be the same yeah or not or is heat loss a function of the absolute temperature it's also a function of time something that's yeah. very rapidly versus slow right mm -hmm. Right, so if it burns really quickly, it doesn't have as much time to heat up the flask or the, right, or the metal apparatus. Yeah, there was just, you know, time. We didn't measure time, how long something burned. So maybe this is uh, an example of where if you had one of those bomb calorimeters or maybe one of the fancier with the styrofoam. I'm not I'm not sure how, how do you do that with the flame? Or? Oh, I don't. You don't have flame. a flame. I just use the okay. styrofoam cup. Got it. We, the fanciest thing we do is, is a acid and metal in it. Yeah. So I've never done bomb calorimetry before, have you? Yeah. yeah. And so how do you do an open flame? With so it depends on the one. You, get, you can get them like the upper end ones where they, you, they have a condition system inside them. So you can put a fuel set and it's kind of like a kind of like your um, lighters here. You light it inside mm -hmm. in, the, in the controlled space. You know, but for, he, he's mentioning the styrofoam cup telemetry, that's for an acid base mm -hmm. or any other kind of chemical reaction that there is going to be exothermic or endothermic aspects to where you're going to see a difference in the temperature. Any other comments? Do you think you can do this with your students? Good. I just thought I'd mention, I just was curious about how expensive they were. And I found a really cheap bomb calorimeter here for $12. And on wow. the same page, I'm seeing them up to about $7,000. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's a flat number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you all. And again, your data and everything is on the Google Drive, that, so you can go later and download that. And there's a blank page where you could make printouts for all your students and similar to what you had today. <coughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, next, um, what we're gonna do is
move into a, a different type of fuel. So let me uh, let me go over all of the fuels that that we're learning about, um, just so we all kind of have a grasp of them. Uh, what are the different types of energy sources that we've got? Coal. Coal. Petroleum. Oil. What? Wind. Wind. Natural gas. That's four. Hydro. 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 Solar. Biomass. Biomass. Geothermal. Geothermal. Yeah, that's all of them. Nuclear. And nuclear. That's what we're going to do next. Um, yeah. So, just always keep those um, in mind as you uh, as we're going through all of these uh, different sources. So, um, David Demuth from uh, Valley City State uh, University. He's going to talk to you about uh, nuclear. Uh, Actually, everything nuclear. Yeah. All right. So, okay. See if that works. Okay. Okay. Nuclear seems to be kind of the mysterious fuel because it's actually got some good attributes. Um, one of the things we we talk about uh, in in you'll leave thinking about maybe the what is sustainability. Um, some of us like to think of it as a three-legged stool or <coughs> the economy, so social. Uh, there's 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 pieces of this. Um, when I think about what's going on in the atmosphere these days, it's so often we think about the, the stuff we breathe uh, is infinite. Uh, we used to dump our oil in the rivers because we thought the rivers were infinitely large. No, we don't, we know better. We, we do a lot of dumping into the atmosphere now and um, we should stop. Uh, we're seeing the effects. Uh, and why I like to talk about nuclear energy is I don't see how we're going to get away from any repair unless we stop emitting that or very soon, like zero emission. And nuclear energy is that. There is no part of it that um, gets into the atmosphere. What you see when you're driving by Monticello uh, going to the cities off to your left is a big plume of steam. It has nothing to do with what's going on inside. So I hope with um, this short time I have with you is maybe to leave you, uh, to give you some uh, uh, new knowledge about nuclear energy and I think it's a hope uh, for the short time. The, the, the dilemma is the stuff that uh, the, the, the refuge from it is um, horrible to manage tens and hundreds of thousands of years. Um, what might be interesting is uh, for a for a, a nuclear plant for an entire year, the uh, refuge would uh, more or less fit under that table. So it's not a lot. It's just what it is. It's very potent. So there's pros and cons, and hopefully you might have conversations with your students on what are the pros and cons when it comes to, to, to nuclear energy. So uh, let me uh, break it down to, uh, uh, firstly, what radiation is. Uh, I particularly like this shot because I captured it myself when I was at Idaho National Laboratory. Um, probably the lab, there's a group of national laboratories around Argonne, Fermi, and all these, and I've been to some, but uh, if you want a go-to place for nuclear energy, it's the Idaho National Lab. That's They're the ones doing all the new breeder reactors and all these new technologies that maybe produce um, uh, electricity uh, at uh, uh, maybe a, a way to where the ref, refuge or that what's left over is is, in, is, is nearly as bad. So um, three types of, of, of nuclear of, of radiation. Okay, that's kind of a it's you know radiation isn't such a bad word uh, because the sun's doing it every day and I like tomatoes and particularly when it's put on pizzas. So without that type of radiation, we would never grow our tomatoes, right? So we all right. So, but the kinds of radiation, so those would be a particle known as a photon, 
H-O-T-O-N, which, uh, not a proton, not an electron, but a photon. And there was some debate some years ago, 100 or more, that we couldn't figure out if that photon was like a little marble, and maybe a little BB, or maybe like a little packet of energy that behaved like a fluid or something. No, it doesn't matter, particle or wave, we don't care, it grows my tomatoes. But there's other kinds of particles, and, and you could think about um, something called helium, helium balloons, okay? Um, uh, use them at parties, the lighter than air kind of thing. Um, if you could take uh, uh, a helium, which turns out it has two protons and two neutrons in it, and it has two electrons that orbit in stable uh, helium, uh, if you could sort of flick off those electrons somehow, we call that ionization, um, then we basically have an alpha particle. And so that's what in this list here, alpha particles made of two protons, two neutrons can be stopped by skin or a sheet of paper, but can cause damage if inhaled or ingested. Okay, alpha particle. Beta particles are basically an electron. Uh, again, we like electrons. They move down wires and they uh, maybe cook the pizza. So um, this is way gas and whatnot, but for beta particles, it's just another word for an electron. So alpha particles are basically helium you're used to. The beta particles are basically electrons. And gamma rays are, maybe you're not, you're used to those too because you go to the dentist. And when you go to the dentist, it's an x-ray to check to see if you need a filling or something. But actually, gamma rays are more energetic x-rays. That's all they are. So they're basically an x-ray, but a little faster, um, maybe much faster, but they're about the fastest. So and it turns out those are just photons at high energy. So, hmm. So we're basically talking about stuff we're used to. We just kind of call it alpha, beta, and gamma, and it sounds like Greek to me. But And then another type of radiation is neutrons, but we, we don't need to talk about neutrons, although they're going to come into an activity we're going to do just very shortly. Um, so go back to, um, uh, I guess, two centuries ago, or the late 1800s, and a um, uh, physicist, uh, Henry Becquerel, he noticed that in certain rock samples that um, they, they had this sort of, let's say, energetic property. Um, they, uh, uh, the idea was that, uh, well, photo, photo, photo plates, uh, any photo, if, if you remember the kind of uh, cameras that uh, you had to have processed at the drugstore or something, and if you would have, uh, for some reason, somebody opened up the camera and light came in and the film would be exposed, oh my gosh, what pictures did I lose? Okay, well, okay, imagine going back um, long ago, about 1800, eight, late 1800s, doing sort of the same thing, but in those days, if you remember sort of at least the Western movies, uh, they were kind of big glass plates, and they were sensitive to light, and the cameras, and they, okay, so they put these big black hoods and all these things over it, and they'd open a shutter and close it and maybe illuminate with some gunpowder or something like that. And they take photos, and there's some really cool photos in this building, uh, old Native American shots and stuff that are particularly on, like, uh, just different glass in it. They're, they're, they're quite interesting. But, okay, I'm going to store them in my drawer. I'm going to go out. Oh, wow, check this out. I dug this out of the ground, and this rock, when I make glass, it actually makes the glass look sort of orangey and shimmery. Wow, that's pretty cool. I'm going to sell that and make lots of money. Well, it turns out the orange glass and the blue glass back in that era was radioactive. We didn't know that then. But that vase was sitting on top of that desk where the photo plates were. They pulled the photo plates out and some family was yelling at each other, who exposed my plates? Well, they scratched their head. They figured out it was the vase that was sitting on top. The vase, how did it was closed completely? Well, the vase has this natural propensity to like just spawn radioactive particles at regular rate. That's what radioactivity, just throwing them out. Okay? Hmm. Alpha, beta, gamma, okay, who cares? But one of those, okay? So somehow probably the gammas in the rock that you can dig out of the earth was okay, radioactive. Well that was cool. So we started studying that and actually Marie Curie and I think had some I probably died of, of, of exposure and others. And then Einstein came along and we started developing quantum mechanics, relativistic quantum mechanics. And now we have, we actually played with quantum mechanics when we were talking about those solar panels we were using earlier. 
it's actually, I, I use the word quantum efficiency, but it's basically the physics of the very small. Because things don't behave like planets and cars crashing. Uh, when it gets really small, it behaves differently, and that's where the debate on particle and wave came about. So just give you an, a, a sort of a feeling of when this stuff started getting developed and discovered, that radioactivity was kind of cool faces and stuff, and we started exploring it. That picture there with the Fiesta Ware, maybe some of you remember that? Yeah, that too was glazed in some sort of radioactive um, uh, material, the paint and stuff, so they, uh, in principle, were low-grade radioactive. Uh, but um, we have some uh, smoke detectors over there that we were playing around. Hopefully, we were going to show you a Geiger counter working on this Americana, uh, Americanium uh, 241, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, okay, alpha, beta, gamma, it exists. We discovered it. That's what physicists did then. Um, in order to measure this stuff, this so-called Geiger counter, um, and maybe you've seen something like the civil defense thing. Uh, this is old school. We thank Eric for going and finding this somewhere in a room around here, and it, it actually worked. But, uh, and did you know uh, your smoke detectors typically had a little bit of radioactivity in it? It uses the same idea as the so-called ionization chamber. So, okay, back to that helium idea. You flip, if you could flip off the electrons in helium, you would say you ionized helium. So that's an alpha particle. So what happens is it's some kind of, uh, of, of you fill this chamber up with um, something inert, that word. So over to the right of the periodic table, you got argon, neon, krypton. Those are inert in the sense that the outer shell of electrons, which they're assembled, um, is filled with eight electrons. And eight electrons is sort of a magic number with the with, um, elements in the periodic table. It's very stable. And for you to take one electron out of eight, it's difficult. All right, if you had seven, it would like to have an eighth. So there's all these give and takes when it comes to the atom. And so if you fill that up with something inert and, and you try to flick anything off, it's it's, it's not going to. It's not going to give up that electron very easily. But if you take a big chisel and a big hammer and whack it, you might be able to break off some of the electrons. And that chisel and hammer are actually the particles like alpha, beta, and gamma particles. They're actually pretty energetic. It's a big hammer, it turns out, relative to these stable particles. And as it goes through there, it actually, um, the argon, which has the eight electrons, and it actually kicks off one or two of the electrons. Well, it turns out, let me, I know I changed this. Let me, uh, let me just make sure I got, uh, yeah, I added a, here we go. Okay. So there's this thing called a, it's an avalanche, basically. One electron isn't going to, um, uh, 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 turn on your detector or make a count. But many will. And what happens is that one released ionized electron then actually spawns photons, which then turn around and make electrons, which turn around and spawn more photons. And there's this avalanche that occurs. It's when energetically favorable. So you actually, you're actually measuring sort of a splash of, of many, and they call that a Townsend avalanche. Let me, um, I think I got this will work. Yeah, um, I'm gonna since I I'm gonna pretend I have a gig. All right, I'm gonna make some noise here. So I'm gonna. This is uh, how what you might hear with a a, a Geiger counter. Let's see if I can make this work. Um, hold on, just a second. Oh no, that was it. Just double check that. And this worked earlier. Here, I'm just gonna turn my sound up. Okay, that's kind of a moderate rate. What you're getting out of this thing 
is something called count. Um, and basically, it's just counting how many avalanches occur based on. So if, if and I don't know what 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 element that was, but it was sort of at a a, a, a margin rate. So you you would you would say okay that, and then the other some of these the newer ones will measure either in counts or dosage. And dosage is something you can look up and compare to what how many what's the dose when you uh, get an X-ray from the doctor? How many how many X-rays can you get in a given year based on the the problem is is that it interacts with Oh, the biologist can help me, but you know your cells don't like that high energy incoming particles, and it actually messes with them. So the DNA gets augmented, and all these sort of things. So uh, that was sort of a moderate one. Let's hear an extreme one. These are naturally produced in some sort of element. That's like freaking out right now. So giving you a two, this is basically what you would have heard live. Okay, great. Um, well, I'll get to radon in just a minute. So this is... Uranium-235, and I'll tell you what the 235 is in just a minute. But it's in what we call a cloud chamber. It's sort of like a, an alcohol. But what you're seeing here is a little small amount of uranium in this cloud chamber, and you can see how it's just throwing out something, all right? That's the radiation. That's, that's, that's the alpha particle, the helium without its electron. And it's naturally occurring, and it will do this for another 100,000 years, okay? Thus the problem. How do we, we manage it? But do notice this, that they don't go out forever. This is sort of a small area. It can actually get absorbed in the, in, in the cloud chamber and stop. So it's, it's and then the water gets um, warmer because it gets energetic. Uh, it absorbs that energy, and when you... Energy and heat are on equal on, on equal footing. So, so th to me, that gives you a really good sense of when you think of that vase with the orange vase that you can't see it, but these little things are flying out at some regular rate. And don't put your arm nearby because it'll just keep colliding with your cells and it'll burn you. Okay, it's not. It's not. Good. You can think of Chernobyl and all these things. It turns out in this this um, um, PowerPoint is available in your folders. Um, there's a number of little links in here. So if you choose to, if you like to use some of these for your classes, by all means. But it turns out you can actually make your own little cloud chamber. If you get from Amazon, I think it's just a, probably like the, uh, the, the there's just such a small amount of, of radioactive you can buy on the end of a pen and you can put it and make your own. It's kind of a cool thing for uh, students to try to make their own cloud chamber. Uh, so there's a link there, how to, it's kind of a cool thing. So, All right, so I think you have a sense of, uh, of, um, of, of, of radioactivity. Let's think about what what did that 235 mean? So you're, now you're looking at a periodic table. And uh, again, uh, over, over to your right, you see the, the inert gases, helium, ne neon, argon, krypton. You weld with argon and these sort of things. Um, and then what I have here is radium on purpose because one of my other little passions is... It's um, 14 hours. I think it's important. All of, all of Minnesota and all of North Dakota and I believe almost all of South Dakota, has a high level of, 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 of radium in, in the soils. And as a result, our basements have a high level of radon if they're all closed up. The trick with radon is to move air. Uh, it's cool. It's, you can live down there and you sleep down there as long as you keep cycling the air. Just get it. But what happens is that radon, radium in this case, the, the 226 is a number on the periodic table. I've got it highlighted. Um, 
you go over uh, 80, it's, let's see. So it's it's got, um, you in this here you can see two eight, or those are actually the electrons that are, the 226 are the number of protons and neutrons. And the 88 is, is the number of protons. So, you, okay, so I always like to think of the atom as like a little sack of marbles. It's pretty good. So a little sack, and there's protons and neutrons in there. And why the neutrons want to stick to the protons? Huh. Neutrons are neutral. Protons aren't. So there's something else that's hold, something strong is holding those things together. I like to think of them as little springs holding them together because, you know, if you pull a spring apart, it's harder to pull the further it comes apart. And maybe it breaks, but um, so it's hard to pull things out of the nucleus. It's hard to actually put things in the nucleus. So it's spring is a good metaphor for how things work with within. So um, uh, basically, those numbers like 235, 226 are counts of the things in the sack of marbles. Okay, so think of it that way. And and things that are sort of down deep in the periodic table don't really happen naturally, or they can, but they're rare, much more rare. I mean. Um, uh, our Native American speaker said something very powerful today that we're basically all stardust. This is something Carl Sagan liked to say quite a bit, that we all do come from stars exploding and wow. So, um, and so we, we share that, that, that heritage. So, in, but so the stuff that uh, less than iron sort of occurs often in our world and things greater than iron on the periodic table don't tend to happen often in our world because it would have taken extra things to happen because stars, when they explode, they don't create things great, much greater than iron, okay? So you have to like press them together and maybe things underground, different geological processes may produce that. But um, I guess Lake Agassiz was that lake that spanned way up and went all the way down to South Dakota and spanned out. I'm thinking of the Red River Valley now. And is that ice? That was a Maha ice. I mean, that's just bizarre to think there was a mile of ice straight up all around it. And, and this thing, as it, it moaned, it, it kept retreating over millions of years, going back and forth. It would just turn up all kinds of rocks and stuff. And it, it, as you can imagine, a lot of that on the beaches of Lake Agassiz basically were the stirred up rocks dug from deep, often the heavier stuff that might have been like uranium. So in part, that's kind of my vision on how, why maybe there's a lot of radon in this area, or radium, because of some of the geological processes that went on. But it's here, and you have to be careful. Um, but there's a natural decay process. So as you saw in the uh, image of uranium-235, uh, and just this constant throwing out of alpha particles, uh, in this case, you've got this natural, this, so if you count 226 and you subtract 4, you get 222. So 4 what? 2 neutrons, 2 protons. So that's an alpha decay. So radium, 226, naturally uh, uh, turns into to, 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 to radon 222. And then, um, and, and it can do it through 4 gammas, or it can do it, through, but mostly. And then that happens... Um, I think that's, that's 1,620 years on average, okay, uh, for half of this thing called half-life, and we're going to learn just a little bit about that. Um, and then uh, it takes about four days, so the stuff in your basement is really only like a four- or five-day event. And then if you could keep moving air, sort of every fourth day, turn on the fans and turn them off, you might, you should just keep the fans on. But, and then you've seen sometimes the mitigation is like a four-inch PVC pipe that runs through your roof very small circulating fan and just keep stuff moving out of your sump room because that's under the rock and it's the gases. Actually, drought is when radon is a big problem in your basement, not when the clays get really wet. It sort of sort of secures it. But when it gets droughty, big cracks form in your yard. You notice that? Your foundations crack, bad stress on your... So actually, drought times is when a lot of radon gets tends to be... It's a gas, so it sort of trickles up through gravity. Anyway, but you can see this sort of chain of reactions that happen naturally. Can't stop it, can't, can't, can't increase it. It just happens, and we've learned to understand how this process. This is what nuclear physicists stuff have done. This is a nice caption of, of you can see. Uh, 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 it's kind of a, a sense. These are, 
again, this is quantum mechanics, so they're not really ball type balls, but they are good references of what's going on. Students can can. So let let's do a couple activities um, to get a sense of what the nuclear aspects. So I need you to have your laptops up, and we're going to try to at least build an atom. Then we're going to play with some isotopes. And this this is a good. Uh, you could do this in chemistry or or, or, or right? So there's a website, PHET, PHET. Uh, you can search it, Colorado, EDU. And then, uh, if you will, there's a there's a site. I'll go there too. But um, so if you go to um, PHETcolorado.edu, and uh, up here, let's see which one am I doing? I'm doing build an atom. Okay, so if you type build, okay, um, you can see build an atom shows up. So pHET.colorado.edu, and um, they're nice when they're so-called HTML5. That means they run on your browser. You don't have to install Flash. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Okay. So phet.colorado.edu. Anyone using FET? I think I talked to. I'll I'll give entire lectures in FET world. It's really nice, <laughs> and it's not just physics. There's biology, chemistry, there's even math and statistics. So it's some cool stuff. Highly recommend it. And it's mostly developed from a consortium of um, uh, physicists and. And, and teachers, so it's not like, and they, it doesn't charge. We're not; they're not trying to make any money. So let's let's like put a few marbles in our uh, in our sack and see what we can come up with, just to get a sense of what I mean, because neutrons are a really important attribute of this whole nuclear phenomenon. So charge and and so uh, okay. So if if for example, if I throw a proton in there, oh, I got a hydrogen atom. Let me throw an electron on there. And now I have neutral hydrogen, which maybe you knew that, that hydrogen was one proton in one electron that orbits. Okay. Now, if I apply a match under this, I might be able to get this electron to hop up to this next shell, and it would be energized. But I can also do something kind of cool that most people don't know, is that I can actually shove a neutron in there, and it's still hydrogen. Oh, so... Hydrogen is hydrogen because of the number of protons in it. And that's where it sits on the periodic table. Okay. In fact, uh, we call that deuterium. In fact, you can throw another one in there. Okay. We call that tritium. And you can make these things. So you, instead of like hydrogen, two of those, and oxygen, H2O, water, drink, we need it. Probably a gallon a day would be more than I can handle, but I should. Okay. Uh, but you can drink D2O. I don't know. Could you? It's hard to make. The, it's, it, it takes a lot of energy to make. But you can make these things. Okay. So let's, let's try to make, let's look at an alpha particle. I'm going to make, a, I'm going to pull this electron out. Uh-oh. Wrong one. I didn't know I could put, pull. All right. So now, look, I have helium. And, and, and stable helium would have two electrons in it. Okay. Make sure All right, so we, we got a sense of what's going on. Okay, um, and again, if somehow I could rip those electrons, I basically ionized helium. There you go, it's an alpha particle. So um, these, uh, I guess, so if I throw in another neutron, you can see it's unstable. I don't know. I think if you keep throwing neutrons in there, it'll blow up or something. So it's shaky. I don't know. Uh, the little state, the stable, unstable button. We need a little shake around a little bit. Okay. Oh, it may be stable. All right. I don't know. Can anybody throw all your protons in and tell me how many you get? I'm curious how far up the. I don't think we can build everything, but at least you get a sense of of stability. 
Uh, no, that's like the, that's like the, the batteries on the shirt. Yeah. I think they changed that or something. You got to really turn it up, like to 100 volts or something before it starts to fry. Okay, so this isn't too exciting. Okay, mind you, it does it does it does a nice job at sort of getting your your atomic sense going on, your nuclear and atomic sense. Okay. Um, and you can learn things about charge and all this stuff. So I'm going to throw a, oh, neon's about all I can do. All right. Neon, neon gas is kind of cool. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So let's go back to the, let's go to another one of these things. This is pretty cool. So um, let's. There's one more, and it's called isotopes and atomic mass. So I'm going to go backwards, uh, and I'm going to search for isotopes and atomic mass. Isotopes and atomic mass. These have little sheets. Isotopes. And this one. I just want to call your attention to, I would guess that um, uh, these two together could make up part of a lecture if you're trying to explain the atomic phenomenon to your students. So just, uh, all right, so, uh, and then it actually gives you sort of the natural abundance. Let's see, and you can click through carbon, uh, let's see, neon, it, it, it actually tells you, so like neon here again, 20, uh, the combination of protons and neutrons, 20, uh, 10 is uh, just the protons. And in a stable world, you'd have an associated 10 electrons. And so that, that's another little reference to, 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 to know. So, oh, here's my, uh, here's my little uh, uh, mapping, I guess. Um, what you're looking here, this back to the radon problem. So all of North Dakota has got, and, and Red's, you know, go home screaming, my gosh, what are we going to do? I think this is all parts of North Dakota. Um, it exceeds the limit that, I don't know, the FDA or somebody, that's four pica curies per liter or something like that, whatever. Um, I mean, it, it could be a lot worse. I mean, I've seen numbers like if, if four is... The maximum that you really want to have around on a regular basis. I've seen 40 and 400. So in caves and stuff, and it's like so at the lab, we did a very. It was very important for us when we were working underground that uh, they moved air and they did cycle the rooms, like several rooms a day. So you can kind of see all the places, and then measuring some kind of. There's a case where it's up to 572. So. Um, um, yeah, you should be worried, and you should you should be you should be conscientious about what's going on in your basement. And in principle, you're probably where you sleep. Okay. So I'm not going to do this. I'm I'm not going to do this experiment. Uh, but we're going to do. We have M and M's. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do. But I did want to call something to your attention. Like so, if um, if if grandmother or or your sister or somebody was here and they said, "Hey, man, I got to give you a thousand bucks," right? Yeah, I'll take a thousand dollars. Give it to me. And you go, ah, but you have to put it in the bank, right? So you say, ah, it's so okay. And let's say you somehow can make four percent interest on the year. And and so what? You put a thousand bucks at the beginning, and let's say January one, and you go to check out how much money you have at the end of the year. You're in four percent on the year. How much do you have at the end of the year? Yeah, ten thousand forty. You're in forty bucks. And you do that again, but now the next year you're starting out with a thousand forty. And you're going to grow your money now four percent on the thousand forty, so you're going to have you know it's not going to be thousand eighty. It's going to actually be a little bit more and a little bit more. So you're going to compound your interest. I think we all kind of get that, right? And it turns out that that phenomenon of growing your money is exponential in nature, and you see that in this graph. And what I've got going out to twenty fifty five, I see that I started out. Um, this would be uh, earning forty. This is just on the interest part. You can see my interest increasing on an annual basis, how much I'm growing. And when I try to fit that with a straight line, 
it's clearly not a straight line. It looks maybe like a quadratic, a parabola. No, it's actually exponential. Okay. Keep, keep that in mind with this activity. Where's our... our uh, in, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do M&Ms. Go ahead and describe it. Okay. So this is a great thing you can do with your students uh, on, on m and M. So what? You could do this with coins, too. I got a big pile of pennies at home. I'm not sure what good pennies are anymore. But Okay, so pennies have a head or a tail, right? And some of us know math and statistics and, you know, it's all these binomial distributions or Poisson, all these statistical things that make your head melt. Uh, but um, um, basically, if you, you know, roll a coin, you get a head or a tail, right? All right. So to understand how radioactivity works, which it works a whole lot like flipping a coin, there's a probability of decay. All right. What I mean by decay, it would be the opposite of growth, okay, right? Because if you grow your money, it grows exponentially. So if I could decay my money, it would, it would bend down, okay? You would have less money after some period of time. You would have less radioactive substance over a, 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 a period of time. So as a nice way to get our students to understand how radioactivity works, um, we can actually pull out M&Ms, and you can eat them afterwards if you want, I guess. So, uh, so Tim, Tim's passing around this. That I think is it, is it fifty M&Ms we're gonna give, uh, or or a hundred? Okay. I, I, yeah, I I think it was a hundred. Yeah. So we're gonna give you a certain number of M&Ms. Okay. Now I need. We're gonna. This is gonna be a little bit of a spreadsheet activity. How many feel you really feel really confident working in spreadsheets? Right, one of us. Right. So maybe in 20 minutes you'll be more competent. So here's what I'd like to do: is at least one, if not all of you, which uh, I want you to like. We're gonna record this. So let's say you have a hundred M and M. You're gonna. Or actually, in your little hand. You're gonna. You're gonna. What are we gonna do, Tim? We can do either way. Take out the heads, or they can you, decide. You, you decide. You either take out the head, or uh, you decide which is head. I guess M is head. You, you decide that. So, but anyway, you're gonna you're gonna roll them in, pull them out, and count. And that oh, number needs to be written. Count, back. count how many you have at first. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're gonna keep doing that until you have no more, and then we're gonna build a spreadsheet with this. Okay. There's a mystery about <laughs> 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 It's basically a reference to the isotopic nature of the atom. So, uh, and what I mean by isotope is basically the number of neutrons in it. Okay, so certain atoms have 
more neutrons or less, and we're just going to stick with a case where there's two, but if we had three-sided dice or four-sided dice or 12-sided dice, we could actually do this same experiment, okay? Shaken. It's been shaken. Yeah, we. That would be closer than probability. Twenty-nine. How many guys did y'all start now? Six. So, okay, so, you, so you start off with your dad. Okay. You design your first page. You can pick All right. Oh, I'm going to do. So I'll pick uh, the line in my data. Yeah. Okay. 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 How many of you have second? Six. So, let me coach you on some spreadsheets, Sam, if you, uh, well, yeah, Excel, see, this is so easy. Yeah, I'm starting with zero. <laughs> All right, maybe I'll, I'll title these, uh, circle and above, let's see. Trial and number, okay, something like that. Okay, and um, I, I like to use formulas with my spreadsheets, and, and so I'm going to do a couple of those little tricks there. So I'm going to use your data because it looks like. So how many trials did you have? Or you went out? Nine. Nine. Okay. So it's, instead of counting zero, one, two, three, five, I'm going to actually say that this cell is the previous cell plus one. Uh, and anytime you use formulas in spreadsheets, you start it with an equal sign. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I do that, I can now drag that little corner down. Okay. And then I don't have to type one, two, three, four, five. If you do like uh, zero, one, two, and then grab the corner. So you go to, uh, kids 
I just so cringe a little bit when they connect. Oh, I know. You can, you, can, you, can, you can avoid that. Oh, right. You don't care. Yeah, I've used that before. Yeah. God, that sets. Okay. So, Daphne, how do you do with spreadsheets? Are you, but you, how do you do? Are you? Um, you're confident? No. Well, we're just yeah, that's, I'm, I want to know. Excel? I can do that a little bit. So, um, so I, there's this argument that when you grow your money, it behaves like an exponent. So uh, let's see if you decay your M and M's if it behaves like an exponent. And so, um, uh, what's your number? Give me, give me your number, real quick. Okay, uh, 29, uh -huh. 17, 8, 5, 4, 2. Two, one, zero. All right. Now, if you did that again, what would you see? You would see different numbers, right? Right. Did you try it again? That, that was so fast. Let's do it. Let's do it. Do it one more time. If you have time. Okay. So. And then you put your numbers and you put your line or if you want a line, you put a line, and then your labels. So there's nothing that. Nothing now. So. Okay. You can move my labels. That's the preview of it. He didn't like my lines. Switch up the lines. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does it faster. Yeah. It's so much easier to have kids do that this than the extra. I don't know if it matters, but could I? Couldn't I? Uh, I'm not going to. But couldn't imprint? Did you really? Could record yeah. it. So you did it a second time. Oh, okay. Lorraine, what was okay, your so number again? So your first number. Your first number. Yeah. Eight. Okay. Eight. 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 How many were left? Ah. Yeah, yeah. And then I just add a two groups. And twenty-five. Eight. 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 Uh, Kyle, how'd you do? Are you still going? Seven, eleven. We got twenty-nine again, eighteen, and then eleven. Okay. All right. Is there anything, Matt? If you did it again, you would see similar behavior, but different numbers, obviously, right? All right, and then we're going to plot these. So, a little, uh, as soon as, as soon as I get three, two, who went that? Oh, yeah. Okay, that so, two, okay. Yeah. 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 Ten, nine, four, two, one. It took one last one to eight. The last one had both. We have to go until they're all gone. Do you need uh, our numbers also? Okay, Eric, would you or uh, 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 yeah, I'll take the more number. Seven, three, two, two, one. one. Okay. What do you got? I've got uh, 70, uh, 38, 16, 
Ten. Seven. Five. Three. One. Okay, what was your, uh, what was after left? Uh, three. Two, two, one. All right, zero, and then zero. Uh, I'm assuming. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to insert. A, I'm going to sort of grab. I'm just going to do this first one here. But basically, what you do is you would. Yeah, I'll take another try. Uh, Forty-two, eighteen, eleven, five, three, two, dot go. All right. All right, so it's almost like I mean, you could count the number of times it takes. You could see they're all different. Uh, this one was pretty quick. That's just the way the nice row. Okay, but um, let's. I mean, you can. Some people are really good at looking at numbers. I'm better at looking at like graphs, and so I think most of our students are. So I'm going to insert, and this works for both. I'm in Google Space, but Excel is not too much different. And I'm going to insert a chart, but I'm really particular about the type, the type of chart. Uh, I like my scatter plots, and I don't want to connect them with lines. That's kind of key. And I'm going to I'm going to make it look pretty because I'm going to write a big report and get 100 points for it or something. Something like that, and uh, it's nice that it's okay. And then um, I'll insert yes, okay. And okay, it doesn't look linear, right? Let me get that. I'll I'll just do right there for now, and and all of us will discover. Okay, I'll shrink it just a little bit. Um, a way to determine linear uh, behavior on a scatter plot um, is if you right click, um, there's insert trend line probably. This is different for some reason. I think I'll go right here and just click trend line. Maybe put some data labels. Ah. So, all right. And then there's another there's another uh, parameter that's called R squared. If it's a one, then it's perfect fit. It's obviously kind of this isn't a line at all, is it? So then one would try to fit it with maybe a parabola, and they could fit it with an exponent. Okay, but the point is is that um, if you think about an M and M as being sort of like uh, two sides of an atom, I guess one. Basically, uh, uh, an ion. Uh, then uh, you get this decay sense with time or rolls or trial. So, I guess in a sense, though, that if you go back to that first image of the uranium two thirty five, just throwing uh, 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 alpha particles out. Every time it throws it, it sort of rolls a little mini dice and decides if it's going to actually spawn a particle. Mm -hmm. What's kind of interesting is the energy spectrum of those particles are all pretty well understood. It's not all the same energy, but it's a distribution of things. So, um, so uh, now you have this idea, at least, that in the you can. You can more or less characterize the time it would take for you to go from your original number of M and M's to the time it took to get to say half. And if I just look at it, it took one trial. I'm, I'm saying time, but uh, so I, I went to 60 to 30, and then you can do that again and again. And there's something called a half life, which is what I just decided. What I just mentioned was that uh, the time it takes to get to half of the original population. 
uh, it's called the half-life. And generally, when you talk about radioactive materials, you talk about the half-lives. And those are the numbers like 1,620 days for that radium. And then stuff like 16,000 or 160,000 or for the stuff that is really useful at making electricity, which again, you know, is just boiling water. Um, which seems kind of weird, isn't it? Like, well, I'm going to fire this, I'm going to boil water, so it's pressurized steam to turn a turbine because it's mechanical. And that, that's kind of important. Let me see where I'm at here. Okay. Um, so let's, let's talk a bit, a little bit about the nuclear power generation piece. Because that um, is, is, okay. So um, as of now, there's 104 of these uh, nuclear plants around the nation, and uh, interesting to see the embrace, say in France, a much smaller area, but other countries that they've been, and and really you want to make sure that they don't fail, like Chernobyl. Um, What's the name of the Japanese one? Fukushima. Fukushima, yeah. yeah. Which was uh, basically... That affected us. Uh, on the West Coast, right? Okay. I, it's, those were error judgments on the designer, basically. They put the backup generator on the wrong side of the, the, the flood wall. <laughs> wow, okay. So, uh, and in, in, in Chernobyl, there was... A lot of politics going on, and the guy in charge just decided out of the blue that he was going to run a safety test without following any policies. He, he knew better, and it failed. So, I mean, there's a cool book out. You can learn about this stuff. But, and it's still a problem, right? Uh, people don't live there. So, I mean, those are the problems. But it really can be controlled, I think, well, and we're doing a decent job, uh, although Three Mile Island and some others were some close calls or whatever. Um, these meltdowns. So we should try to understand what it means for a meltdown. But uh, you see a three, is it really? Yeah, three in Minnesota, none in North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, etc. One in Kansas, it's, or none in Kentucky. Oh, you might ask why. You might ask what, is it flood prone? I mean, that's the one weird one about uh, pig's eye near uh, St. Paul. I think it's pretty close to some flood prone area. You don't want that. So you want geological form. You want things, you don't want earthquakes, right? So, which is weird because I don't think there's many worth, er, worth earthquakes in North Dakota or Wyoming, but there are plenty in California, but there's four. So, all right. So they're distributed around the nation. And the other thing about this is, um, have you heard of local foods? All right. What about local energy, right? Could you like grow your energy and use it? Don't transport it very, because when you transport anything, you lose in efficiency. I mean, why buy your tomatoes from Chile when you can buy them from North Dakota? Uh, you can, and okay, but it sure was a lot of green moss to get, get, get there. So maybe the electricity, I think maybe you know this because you guys, some of you have been to Falkirk, but you know that there, that's a DC distribution that is actually sent into Minnesota. In North Dakota doesn't get to use it, but it turns out that transmission of electricity is more efficient using this so-called direct current versus alternating current. And, uh, and, and I side with whoever that uh, uh, they really do uh, their model for the nation the way they do um, uh, distribution, maintenance, the community, and uh, reclamation. They really is a North Dakota really stands above all. Uh, to be a model for the nation on how, if you're going to mine coal, do it right. And it, so, um, all right. So, and then if you, and this could be another spreadsheet activity for your students, because this is where I got this data, but you could ask your students to go in and find out, you know, what, what the output for all of these are in terms of watts or gigawatts. Okay. These sort of things and then plot it and then to get a and then you could also do it as this one is, as a fraction of the other sources. Dr. Young started out today with asking you to identify the other wind and all the different. Where does nuclear fit in, in into the share? And you're seeing it's actually flat since 1990. It's more or less stabilized to be about 20 percent. 
of the generation that goes on in the United States. And this is a site in the slideshow, this, uh, the, the, the NEI is a uh, link. So, um, uh, and I don't, do we know why it's just not increasing? Why there, I think there's just not been anything built in for a number of years, policies, uh, this, that, or the other. Um, yeah, 79. Know. 79. Aren't there sites closing down also? And uh, they, some. The one in Washington. Yeah, yeah some are closing down. But what it is, there's 104 Wilson. still active. I think that's a recent plot. Wilson, we're reaching like their maximum lifespan. Yeah. Now that yeah. they're getting exemptions, yeah. say, okay, yeah. they can stay with them a little longer. Yeah. So. Is it that we really have gone so far back with our technology that we really don't? Don't get the value of that. Um, or is it well, I don't know. I'm I'm pretty. I mean, solar is so awesome. I mean, and the efficiencies are growing. I just look at renewables, and you almost if we didn't have to do nuclear, it'd probably be better. But I'm not sure we can not do nuclear for about 50 years until we get back caught up. So that's what I'm thinking. I see. We have five up there in Florida. We're not no. a very big state. Yeah, you do have fun. So how how are they old or are they new? Yeah, I don't I don't know. It's be good for your students to research that. Yeah, yeah and they have hurricanes down there, right? So I, would, I would think. So let's I don't I don't have a lot more time, but let's let's look at how they work and let me show you a short video that kind of lays out kind of the debates and that's the kind of thing you could do with uh, students. So again, it's boiling water in this case, um, and that that big concrete that seems to be that shell that seems to be spewing out um, uh, steam uh, actually in principle can be capped with a big concrete or steel thing so in case it does like go into bad mode meltdown mode that you can actually cap it and all this stuff so and you can see by this diagram at least there's some kind of control rods that can so we want to figure out what that means with control um, but basically uh, think again about my little uranium dance, you know, those little things are warming the water. If you just keep it up, they'll heat the water to where it gets to a place of boiling, and that's adjustable by pressure, and then uh, cycling it, uh, and then turning a turbine just like it's not very, very, very uh, advanced technology. This is, would be a boiling water reactor. I think there's been something on the order of 80 different designs that Idaho has engaged in the last 40 or 50 years. And it turns out now they're only focusing on, on basically two. Um, but let's see if this is going to work. This is, um, let me do something here. This is a cool little short animated video. Let's, let's watch this. Let's see if this is have you ever been in an argument about nuclear power? We have, and we found it frustrating and confusing. So let's try and get to grips with this topic. Can you hear that? Let me try one more time. It's, it's not. Have you ever been in an argument about nuclear power? We have, and we found it frustrating and confusing. So let's try and get to grips with this topic. It all started in the 1940s. After the shock and horror of the war and the use of the atomic bomb, nuclear energy promised to be a peaceful spin-off of the new technology, helping the world get back on its feet. Everyone's imagination was running wild. Would electricity become free? Could nuclear power help settle the Antarctic? Would there be nuclear-powered cars, planes, or houses? It seemed that this was just a few years of hard work away. One thing was certain, the future was atomic. 
just a few years later, there was a sort of atomic age hangover. As it turned out, nuclear power was very complicated and very expensive. Turning physics into engineering was easy on paper, but hard in real life. Also, private companies thought that nuclear power was much too risky as an investment. Most of them would much rather stick with gas, coal and oil. But there were many people who didn't just want to abandon the promise of the atomic age. An exciting new technology, the prospect of enormously cheap electricity, the prospect of being independent of oil and gas imports, and in some cases, a secret desire to possess atomic weapons provided a strong motivation to keep going. Nuclear power's finest hour finally came in the early 1970s, when war in the Middle East caused oil prices to skyrocket worldwide. Now, commercial interest and investment picked up at a dazzling pace. More than half of all the nuclear reactors in the world were built between 1970 and 1985. But which type of reactor to build, given how many different types there were to choose from? A surprising underdog candidate won the day, the light water reactor. It wasn't very innovative, and it wasn't too popular with scientists, but it had some decisive advantages. It was there, it worked, and it wasn't terribly expensive. So, what does a light water reactor do? Well, the basic principle is shockingly simple. It heats up water using an artificial chain reaction. Nuclear fission releases several million times more energy than any chemical reaction could. Really heavy elements on the brink of stability, like uranium-235, get bombarded with neutrons. The neutron is absorbed, but the result is unstable. Most of the time, it immediately splits into fast-moving, lighter elements, some additional free neutrons, and energy in the form of radiation. The radiation heats the surrounding water, while the neutrons repeat the process with other atoms, releasing more neutrons and radiation in a closely controlled chain reaction very different from the fast, destructive runaway reaction in an atomic bomb. In our light water reactor, a moderator is needed to control the neutron's energy. Simple ordinary water does the job, which is very practical since water is used to drive the turbines anyway. The light water reactor became prevalent because it's simple and cheap. However, it's neither the safest, most efficient, nor technically elegant nuclear reactor. The renewed nuclear hype lasted barely a decade though, in 1979, the Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania barely escaped a catastrophe when its core melted. In 1986, the Chernobyl catastrophe directly threatened Central Europe with a radioactive cloud, and in 2011, the drawn-out Fukushima disaster sparked new discussions and concerns. While in the 1980s, 218 new nuclear power reactors went live, their number and nuclear's global share of electricity production has stagnated since the end of the 80s. So what's the situation today? Today, nuclear energy meets around 10% of the world's energy demand. There are about 439 nuclear reactors in 31 countries. About 70 new reactors are under construction in 2015, most of them in countries which are growing quickly. All in all, 160 new reactors are planned worldwide. Most nuclear reactors were built more than 25 years ago with pretty old technology. More than 80% are various types of light water reactor. Today, many countries are faced with a choice. The expensive replacement of the aging reactors, possibly with more efficient but less tested models, or a move away from nuclear power towards newer or older technology with different cost and environmental impacts. So, should we use nuclear energy? The pro and contra arguments will be presented here next week. Subscribe, and then you won't miss it. Our channel has a new sponsor, Audible.com. If you use the URL audible.com slash nutshell, you can get a free audiobook and support our channel. Producing our videos takes a lot of time, and we fill a lot of it by listening to audiobooks. For a really entertaining book, we recommend Into Thin Air by so John Krakauer. He's a great writer, and the story is really This is one of three, and the other two actually develop this a little further. So, again, I think this would be a nice resource for your students uh, and they're linked uh, here uh, maybe we would listen to them but let me uh, uh, Tim mentioned Faraday's law earlier the process that if I took a magnet and moved it in and out of closed loop that actually I could actually create light okay so something about magnetism in a closed loop not hooked up to a battery or anything can induce the flow of electrons which is by 
by definition current. So that's another FET activity that uh, is linked from this, this, this talk. Um, which I encourage you to explore to get a sense. I, I think we, we don't remember if, 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 if we've done this one. Here's another link that actually allows you to, um, uh, the control rod here is, you can actually spawn this process and get these, this vision to occur. And then uh, by controlling, you can actually see that this, the simulator allows you to, um, uh, see what it would take to keep it in a long-term sustainable process. That's kind of a cool idea. This link gets into the um, the, the guts of uh, the nuclear reactor, I believe, that's uh, going on uh, as a test in at Idaho. And then, um, being really sensitive to time, uh, but basically what I mean by fission is somehow, let's get one of those neutrons free, figure out who cares? I got a neutron gun, let's say. You can shoot neutrons. And if I shoot it at a uranium-235, uh, just like the M&M &M probability, it's going to have some sense of breaking into smaller parts. And when it breaks into those smaller parts, that's when that release of energy occurs. And that energy gets absorbed in the water and then heats and, 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 and then that's that process. But what's interesting is, is that it spawns a second neutri neutron. Okay, so one neutron comes in, does its thing, creates another neutron of sufficient energy to actually go off and do it again, and to do it again and do it again. And that's the if you let if you have if you do this too much, it blow, it blows up. So you gotta like tweak it, and your gun has to be pointed just the right way to where you do it at a controllable rate in the rods and these sort of things. So it depends on the fuel, but again, FET has this really cool nuclear fission activity that you can play with, your students can play with, and you can practice firing neutrons at uranium and then try to get it to where it doesn't go crazy, all right, to where it actually, and then um, if you noticed with the FET stuff, and if you join as a teacher, I think they check your, your dot ND or something, um, then um, you get all these lesson plans that are all very well scripted and this is the, a link to, to one of the labs that in we've actually done this in other workshops so just not today so sorry but this gives you a sense of, of what uh, you leave with more on the new on, on uh, nuclear fission and then there's another fat one called the dating game so I guess the idea is that at the end of a couple lectures maybe a week focused on this modern physics stuff students could kind of understand what uh, what the science is behind uh, nuclear energy and uh, pretty good good sense and like I suggested before uh, a go to place is the Idaho National Lab um, uh, and you could get a hold of Ann Seaford she's quite she's been up in this area with some of our STEM work she's pretty good to work with and uh, and uh, I think that's where we'll we'll, we'll stop. Uh, that's, does that work for you? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll uh, do some clean evidence. Stand up, do some Can jumping I jacks. I'm wondering about this fed thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they could get on it. They could go in and do this. Play that. Yeah. yeah.